Could you turn back to Ephesians chapter 2? Tonight, I'm going to be bringing a message I've entitled, Grow, Abound, and Increase. It's a message on spiritual growth. And I've been thinking about this message for several months, and I feel like tonight's the time to bring it. I've entitled this morning's message, Gospel Peace. Gospel Peace. Now, you noticed in reading that passage of Scripture in verse 14, it says, He is our peace. A lot of times when we think about peace, we think about a feeling, and indeed, peace is a feeling. But this passage says He is, He Himself is our peace. And then in verse 15, the last phrase, so making peace. Not only is he our peace, he made our peace. And then we read in verse 17, he came and preached peace to you. Gospel peace. What is peace? Well, there's several things that come to our mind when we think of peace. First thing that comes to my mind is a harmonious relationship between nations. They're not at war. They're at peace. They're on friendly terms. No war. And then we think of peace between people. What a blessed thing that is. Peace in the home. Oh, what a horrible thing it is to have a non-peaceful home, but to have a peaceful home. Uh, the peaceful relationship with friends, people who don't judge one another. You don't have to be worried about what you say around them, that it's going to be taken wrong and twisted and used against you, but there's peace. You know that person loves you. You know that person has your back, and you feel at peace. There's no contention between people. Then there's the peace that comes from freedom from being molested. Uh, I know this seems like a trite uh, example, but I remember when I was a kid, there was a bully in my neighborhood. I was afraid to go out. I knew what was going to happen. He was going to give me a licking. And there um, wasn't a lot of peace about that. I know that's a small... But just bullying now in the workplace, whatever you got to deal with, school, bullies. The peace that I love to think most of is peace with God. Where God is at peace with me. Having been justified by faith, we have peace with God. He doesn't have any reason to be mad at me. And I don't have to fear because of my sin, because I'm justified by him. What a blessed thing this is, peace with God. You know, this uh, concept of peace with God can be seen in one of the Lord's names, Jehovah Shalom, the Lord our peace. Gideon. Had the Lord appeared to him, he was scared to death. He thought, I'm going to die. I've seen the Lord. And the Lord said, fear not, you're not going to deny. And Gideon went and built an altar called the Lord our peace. Peace with God has to do with me not lacking anything for peace. I got everything God requires. I'm content, not looking for anything else, because I know I'm accepted through Christ. That is peace with God. No reason for God to be mad. Listen to this scripture from Jeremiah 29, 11. For I know the thoughts that I think toward you, thoughts of peace, 
and not of evil to bring you to an expected end. Now, if you're anything like me, and I dare say you are, quite often you think of the Lord being mad at you. And I understand that. I understand you thinking that way. I think that way too because of our sinfulness and so on. But how precious that passage of Scripture is that I just read. I know the thoughts that I have of you, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to bring you to an expected end. And peace, the feeling. Peace is a feeling. It's a feeling of contentment. It's a feeling of satisfaction. Knowing you don't need anything else. What a glorious feeling. The feeling of peace within. It has something to do with what Paul was talking about when he talked about the joy and peace of believing. There is joy and there is peace in this thing of believing. Now, peace is a feeling and it's a good feeling, but you can also have this feeling of peace that's not well grounded. I want you to think about that. There are people who die peaceful deaths, thinking everything is okay with their soul, and they wake up in hell. The prophet warned of those who cry, peace, peace, when there is no peace. You can have a feeling of peace and that not be a well-grounded peace. Now, God has called the God of peace eight times in the New Testament. And I love this passage of Scripture. Next week, Lord willing, we're going to consider everything in its context, but I just want to consider gospel peace. Gospel peace. He is our peace. He made our peace. He came and preached peace. Gospel peace. Now, I love the way Paul says in that 14th verse, for he is our peace. He is our peace. When the angels announced the birth of the Lord Jesus Christ, their words were glory to God in the highest and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. When Isaiah announced his birth, he said, For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. You see, that son wasn't born. He's the eternal son of God. Now, the child was born, but the son is the eternal son. Unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulders. That means he controls everything. And his name shall be called Wonderful. Counselor. Now, understand this. That word counselor is not a noun. It's a verb. The one who decrees is what it means. He's the one who decrees everything. This is who he is. He's, he's not somebody you can get good advice from. He's someone who controls everything. Everything happens according to his will. His name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God. The Everlasting Father. Somebody says, explain that to me. I can't. Not even going to try to, but that's what it says. He's the Mighty God. He's the Everlasting Father. He is the Prince of Peace. Romans chapter 14 verse 17 says, The kingdom of God is not meat and drink, but righteousness and peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost. Now, if you're in the kingdom of God, that means you have His righteousness. That's a blessed place to be, isn't it? To have His righteousness. And you know what's going to happen if you have His righteousness and you are made to see that? You're going to have peace. 
The only way you're going to have peace is if you see that his righteousness, his personal righteousness, is your personal righteousness. And if you see that, you'll have peace. And you know what else? You'll have joy. The kingdom of God is not meat and drink. It's not do's and don'ts. It's not rules and regulations. It's righteousness. It's peace. It's joy in the Holy Ghost. Turn with me for a moment to John chapter 16. Verse 33. Now in chapters 13 through 16, we have the Lord's last address to his disciples. And then in chapter 17, we have his prayer for his people. But look what he says ending up this last address to his disciples before his death. These things have I spoken unto you for this one singular reason that in me you might have peace. In the world, you shall have tribulation. But be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. We are not permitted to find peace anywhere but in Him. These things have I spoken unto you that in me, you might have peace. Now, who is he speaking to? His disciples. Those who believed on him. He is our peace. Now, it's important for me to make this distinction. He is our peace. Who is the hour? Not everybody. He's not peace to everybody. Every believer, all of God's elect, all for whom Christ died, all who God the Holy Spirit has given life to, those are the ones that find in Him peace. That's who He's speaking to. These things have I spoken to you that in me you might have peace. And that is why Paul said in Philippians chapter 3, Oh, that I might win Christ and be found in Him. That's all I want God to see. And that's the only place I find peace. In Him. If I think of God looking at me, apart from simply seeing me in Him, it just scares me. It makes me think, He's going to send me to hell. With regard to everything, the only place that I find peace is in the Lord Jesus Christ. These things have I spoken unto you that in me you might have peace. Paul said, I don't want to be found anywhere else but in Christ so that all God sees when he sees me is Jesus Christ. Now, if that's the case, you know what? I have peace. If he sees me in any way independent from simply being found in him, I have no peace. The Lord is not going to permit any of his children to find peace anywhere but in him. Look in John chapter 14, verse 27. Remember, he is our peace. He himself, our peace, is a person. Verse 27. Peace I leave with you. My peace. I give unto you, not as the world giveth give I unto you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. My peace I give to you. Now I think of his, what kind of peace does the Lord Jesus Christ have? Well, this is the kind of peace he has. He knows he has perfect righteousness with God. What peace he has. He doesn't have the peace of, of, of sin and guilt. He's perfectly righteous before God. He has the peace of knowing that he controls everything. And there's nothing he has to fear. 
I mean, everything is under his thumb. And it can't be any other way but that because he's God. He's all-powerful. He's omniscient. He controls everything. He's got the peace of who he is. He's got the peace of knowing his Father is pleased with him. He said, I do always those things that please the Father. What peace the Lord Jesus Christ has. And he says, my peace I give unto you. Now that is peace. My peace I give unto you. I love the scripture in 1 John Chapter 4, verse 17, as he is. Well, how is he? Perfectly peaceful with God. As he is, so are we in this world. He is our peace. My peace doesn't come from circumstances. My peace comes from this. He is our peace. It's the, it's the peace of not lacking anything. Listen to this scripture, Colossians chapter 2, verses 9 and 10. In him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily, and you are complete. You're complete. You do not need anything else. You can't be any more loved. You can't be any more accepted. You can't be any more holy. You can't be any more righteous. You are complete. This is every believer. You are complete. How? In Him. In Him. My peace I give unto you. He is our peace. Now go back to Ephesians chapter 2, verse 15. Well, let's start reading in verse 14. For he is our peace, who hath made both, speaking of Jew and Gentile, he hath made both one. You're looking at a Jew, and you're looking at a Gentile. They're both one. That distinction is over. All of God's people are God's heritage. All of God's people are true Jews. He is our peace who hath made both one and hath broken down the middle wall of partition between us, having abolished in his flesh the enmity, even the law of commandments contained in ordinances. For to make in himself of twain one new man so making peace. Have you ever heard a preacher say, have you made your peace with God? Have you made your peace with God? Now somebody that makes a statement like that betrays a complete ignorance of God. Have you made your peace with God? The one who asks a question like that is yet dead in trespasses and sins and has no understanding of the gospel at all. And the believer is offended by a statement like that. No, I've not made my peace with God. He made my peace with God. I didn't make my peace with God. He made my peace with God. Now, according to that 15th verse, he abolished in his flesh the enmity, the hatred, even the law of commandments contained in ordinances. Now listen to me real carefully. Listen to this statement. If you're under law, you're going to have no peace, and all you're going to do is hate God. Now think about that. That's a strong statement, but it's true. If you're under law, you're not going to have any peace, 
And all you're going to do is hate God. But he came and took away the law by fulfilling it, answering its demands. And now you are not under grace. That law has been abolished by what he did. Now, I know people can come up with all kinds of implications about that, but I'm not worried about it. It's the truth. It's what the Bible teaches. If you're under law, all you're going to do is hate God. It's only when you can say with Paul, sin shall not have dominion over you, for you're not under law, but under grace. Now, when you see the law fulfilled and done away with, two things. You have peace and you love God. Those two things are true. You have peace and you love God. But if you're under law, you have no peace and you have no love for God. He abolished. Now, that's what it says, isn't it? He took away the enmity by doing away, fulfilling answering the law's demands, doing it away so that you're not under law. Turn with me to Colossians chapter 1. Not only is he our peace, he made our peace. Now look in verse 20 of Colossians chapter 1. Verse 20. And having made peace through the blood of of his cross by him to reconcile all things unto himself by him I say whether they be things in earth or things in heaven and you that were sometime or before time alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works yet now hath he reconciled in the body of his flesh through death to present you holy and unblameable and unreprovable in his sight. Now, he made peace. He didn't make it available and then offer it to anybody. He made it. He made peace by the blood of his cross. Now, this thing of reconciliation implies that at one time we were on friendly terms before the fall of Adam. But after the fall of Adam, we all fell in him, became his enemies, but he reconciled us. We didn't have anything to do with his reconciliation. He reconciled us by the blood of his cross and its complete reconciliation. God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not imputing their trespasses into them. And look very carefully at verse 22. Now, this gives me peace. He is my peace. He made my peace. And in making my peace, this is what he did. Verse 22. Verse 21. And you that were sometimes alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now hath he reconciled in the body of his flesh through death to present you holy and un blameable and unreprovable in his sight. Now don't um, miss this word in his sight. That's as important as, every, as anything else in that verse of scripture, in his sight. Um, perception is reality to us. We perceive something and it's real to us whether it's real or not. But he sees things as they really are. This is the truth concerning every child of God without exception. You are, because of what he did on the cross, you are holy in his sight. You might not even be so in your own sight, but you are in his sight. And if he sees you that way, that's what you are. You are unblameable. You don't have anything to feel guilty about. There's nothing anybody can blame you for. Nothing in his sight. You are unreprovable. Nothing to reprove you for in his sight. Now, beloved, that's peace. 
That's peace. <laughs> Turn to Romans chapter 4. Verse 25. Who was delivered to the cross is what that's talking about for our offenses and was raised again for our justification. Therefore, being justified, having been justified. Now, when the Lord was hanging on that cross, the sins of God's elect became his sins. And he put them away. And when he was raised from the dead, all of God's elect were justified. You're not justified by your act of faith. You're justified by the actions of the Lord Jesus Christ. The action of the Lord Jesus Christ. What he accomplished. By faith you believe, you believe that. You believe that. That's what faith is. It's believing that we're justified by his faith. One of the reasons, uh, I think about what you were reading there, Claire. Um, one of the reasons I love the King James Version is, you know, it's the only version that says that we're justified by the faith of Christ. If you've got any other version, it says you're justified by faith in Christ. And the reason being, the translator said, well, that doesn't make sense. How can you be justified by the faith of Christ? So they just change it. But in the original, that is the way it reads. And I'm, I'm justified by Christ. Not by anything I did, by the faith of Christ, by the faithfulness of Christ, by the obedience of Christ. Justified now, if you're justified, and this is the very heart of the gospel, if you're justified, that means you're not, you didn't do anything bad. You never sinned. Somebody says, but I know I've sinned. Christ bore my sin. And it's gone. And I have perfect righteousness before God because his righteousness is given to me. That's what justification is. Therefore, Having been justified, by faith we have peace with God. The only way that I have any peace with God is if Jesus Christ justified me. And I don't stand before God in any way except perfect righteousness. Now that gives me peace. That gives me peace. If you put anything on me, my peace leaves. If you put any of my salvation dependent upon me doing anything... I have no peace. I know what's going to happen. But if he did it all, I have peace. He made my peace with God. And this is the peace that passes all understanding. Now back to our text in Ephesians chapter 2. First point is, he is our peace. Well, I'm so thankful it says it that way. He is our peace. Secondly, He made our peace with God. And then in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 17, came, He came and preached peace to you which were afar off and to them that were nigh, speaking of the Jewish people. He came and preached peace. Now, our message is a message of peace. Turn to Romans chapter 10. Verse 13, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. How then shall they call on him in whom they've not believed? And how shall they believe in him in whom they've not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach except they be sent? As it's written, how beautiful are the feet of them 
that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things. Now, I've got to point this out. How beautiful are the feet of them? Now, feet are pretty... Uh, um, if you look at a bunch of people's feet, you can't identify those people. Um, here's my point. If I am preaching as I should, you won't be thinking about me. You'll be thinking about the message. How beautiful are the feet? Face didn't even see. How beautiful are the feet of them that bring this message of gospel peace? If you're thinking of me, either by my bad preaching or how wonderful my preaching, boy, he can really preach. He's got such gift. I've gotten away. I've gotten away. How beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace. Acts chapter 10, verse 36, when they came preaching peace by Jesus Christ. That's the message. Peace by Jesus Christ. He is Lord of all. Now that's a summary of all true gospel preaching. That's what Peter says. He came preaching peace. By Jesus Christ. He's the author of it. He's the cause of it. He's the subject of it. He is the peace. Peace by Jesus Christ. He is Lord of all. I love that. I'm not going to say that you won't you make Jesus the Lord of your life. He is the Lord of your life. Whether you know it or not, you're in his hands. You're in his hands. Your eternal destiny is up to him. Now, does that give you peace? Somebody says, no, it doesn't. No, it doesn't. That doesn't give me any peace. If, my, if it's totally out of my hands. Listen, if it's in your hands, you ought not have any peace because you're going to mess it up. I'll assure you of that. You're going to do, you, you're, you will not be saved if salvation is in your hands in any way to any degree. I'm just dead sure of that. But if it's in his hands, oh, there's hope for the chief of sinners. In his hands. He is Lord of all. Isaiah chapter 40 verses 1 and 2. Comfort ye, comfort ye my people, saith your God. Speak comfortably to Jerusalem. And cry unto her that her warfare is accomplished. You hear that? Your warfare, the rage that goes on within your heart. It's already over. It's finished. It's accomplished. Her iniquity is pardoned. For she hath received of the Lord's hand double for all her sins. Now, if you hear that as gospel, you will feel peace. You'll feel it. Now, if you hear preaching, and I know what this is. I know what I'm talking about. If you hear preaching that makes you feel like you're not measuring up, something's missing. I must not be saved. I'm not fill in the blank. That's law preaching. That's law preaching. That's works preaching. True preaching is a message of peace. Peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Turn with me to Hebrews chapter 12. He is our peace. Amen? He is our peace. He made our peace. We didn't make it. He did it. Our message is a message of peace. Now, I realize that it's not a message of peace to everybody. It, it's, it's a message of conflict to somebody who's trusting their works. But it's a message of peace to all of God's elect. It's the only place they find peace. He is our peace. He made peace. We preach peace. But look here in Hebrews chapter 12. Verse 14. Follow. Pursue. 
peace with all men. Make this your aim. Make this your pursuit. Follow after peace with all men. Listen to this scripture from Romans chapter 12, verse 18. If it be possible, I realize sometimes it's not possible, but if it be possible, as much as life in you is, live peaceably with all men. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. Now, I hope I, well, I'm going to go ahead and say it. I said, I hope I don't have to say it, but I'm going to go ahead and say it, so I guess I do. Um, a peacemaker is, someone, is not someone who avoids conflict at all costs. There are those who, to avoid conflict, they're not going to say anything when the gospel is not being preached. That's not being a peacemaker. That's actually being the opposite. You're not doing anybody any good that way, and I don't want to be that person. I want to stand for the gospel of peace. And if somebody tries to water it down in order to avoid conflict, I don't want to have anything to do with that. And you don't either. Um, so when I'm talking about being a peacemaker, or when the Bible's talking about being a peacemaker, included in that is being someone who's persecuted for righteousness' sake. That's the next thing in the Beatitudes. Blessed are they who are persecuted for righteousness' sake. But in this thing of following Peace. Be a peaceful person. Not contentious. Don't be one of those people, and you know these kind of people, they're so easily offended. You have to walk on eggshells around them. Don't be that person. Don't be one of those people, and you've, you've seen people this, people you feel judged by and criticized by and condemned by, and uh, you don't feel any peace around them. Don't be that person. Be a person where other folks are around you, they feel peace. Peaceful. I want to be a peaceful person. And someone who can say he is our peace. Someone who can understand that he made my peace. It has nothing to do with me. It's wholly to do with him. Somebody who understands this message, it's a message of peace. I love that scripture. God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world. The world was already condemned. But to save the world. It's a message of peace. Peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. And be a peaceful person. Not someone who people feel uncomfortable around and condemned and judged and threatened and you're afraid to what you say around them is going to be twisted. Don't be one of those people. Be someone when people around you, they feel peace. That is gospel <laughs> peace. And it's only experienced through believing believing the gospel. Let's pray. Lord, how we thank you for our Prince of Peace. How we thank you that he is our peace. How we thank you that he made our peace by the blood of the cross. How we thank you for the preaching of the gospel of peace. And Lord, we ask that you would make us peacemakers. We ask that we might be poor in spirit, that you'd enable us to mourn over our sin, to be meek, to hunger and thirst after righteousness, to be pure in heart, to be merciful, to be persecuted for righteousness' sake. But oh Lord, cause us to be peacemakers, peaceful men and women. Bless this message for your glory. And for our good, in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Dwayne, come leave.